Coming up on Star Talk Special Edition, will AI be the end of civilization? Well, but before that happens, will it help us coach sports better? Will it make deep fakes that will destabilize all that we know and trust or can believe in in this world? Also, will it help us explore space? All that and more coming up. This is Star Talk Special Edition, an entire show right now devoted to AI. <laughs> we we don't know is AI good or bad. It's you bad. Heard, oh, <laughs> you heard all about it. Everybody's opining on it. Uh do, is it a problem solver? It's a problem. It, or does it create problems? Uh, how do we use it in space and media in in all kinds of places? Here we are back with Chuck Knight. Chuck, how you doing, man? My co-host. Sorry to tell you, but this is not me. I'm not here. Oh. <laughs> See, <laughs> this is this is uh, my uh, AI doppelganger. That's, that's what that's your in. doppelganger. All right, right I, I have ways to test for that. We'll find yeah. out in a minute. Here's the problem: Get the, the the AI has me tied up in the closet. Help me, please! <laughs> Someone help, help, help me! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gary, yes. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm interested in this because it's not a subject I have any real depth of knowledge about, which is most subjects. I agree, but uh, no. he's lying. That's so. not Gary. That <laughs> is not <laughs> Gary. He's lying. <laughs> Gary's also tied up in a closet. You know, Gary is right next to me in the closet, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, All right. So I'll fun. do my best with your two doppelgangers. So mm -hmm. here we go. Please so do. Gary, set the scene. What do we have here? All right. Today's guest has a doctorate in mathematics from Oxford. That's the Love English it. Oxford. Uh, mm -hmm. Was researching astrophysics and then decided to switch to AI. Author, okay. yes, published author of a book in 2018 called Factor Man. Developed, and I love this thing, developed a computer program called Dr. Phil, that's F-I-L-L, -L, that solves crossword puzzles. And Dr. Phil has competed in professional crossword puzzle tournaments successfully, and now this gentleman works for the delightful people at Google. So today's guest, none other than a dear friend, Matt Ginsberg. Who's returning to Star Talk? Matt Ginsberg, mm. welcome back. Matt Ginsberg. Hey. It's great, uh, it's great to be talking to you all again. Um, I think at the end, we probably should have a vote on whether we want to let Chuck and Gary out of the closet or whether we prefer <laughs> the doppelganger. Mm. <laughs> yeah, whether, whether, whether these are better versions, have. right. So Matt, you... I, what did, what are you doing with Google right now? Or, or are you on some kind of NDA, non-disclosure agreement? So I work for an organization called X. It is part of Alphabet. We are Alphabet's moonshot factory. Which but means, just, just to be clear, Alphabet is the holding company of Google. Alphabet is the holding company of Google and other organizations. Well, right. So when you look, for example. Is part of Google or X in Alphabet? It sounds like it belongs in Alphabet. X, X is in Alphabet. Mm. Okay. We're not part okay. of Google. We're in Alphabet. I, I got to tell you something. For a guy who went to Oxford, I ain't so impressed that you know that X is in the alphabet. Okay. <laughs> I'm just that's letting fair. you know. That's, that's actually fair. <laughs> um, we do the hardest stuff we can think of. Right. It's an unbelievably fun place to work. The people are incredibly smart. We have a project. This is like the X Tapestry. Prize in that, in that spirit. It the is. The X Prize was money for just some as we say, moonshot, something that right. who thought you could make this happen? And you do if you put enough smart people uh, funded by enough money. And then there it is. Is it true that they call it the failure division of of Google because they don't care if you fail? It's all about, you know, the discovery of information and, and advancement through doing stuff that you would never otherwise attempt. So we have this project called Tapestry. The goal is to decarbonize the electric grid. So everybody uses renewables and huge climate impact. Cool. That is so hard. It is. That if we can't do it, nobody's going to be stunned. Right. Any specific mm -hmm. project at X is probably more likely to fail than succeed. Right. But there are some amazing successes. So Waymo, which is Alphabet's self-driving car division, came out of X. We have another project called Mineral that just graduated that has these 
weird vehicles that drive around the tracks between crops on a farm on a farm and they use cameras and machine vision to figure out how the plants are doing and just generally to make farming more efficient wow all of these things are things that that were just as hard as tapestry when they started but they've actually succeeded and now they're out as i mean we they're bets they're part of alphabet so we call them bets and these are mm, other clever. divisions i like that like exit uh -huh. cool um but not and it, it's I have to tell you, it's great working for a company that expects you to do unbelievably hard things and realizes that when you try and do things that hard, you're not always going to pull it off. Right, right. Well, That's of course, amazing. science in general has many, many failures. The press only talks about the successes. So uh, you starting out in science, this would not have been a foreign concept to you other than that there's a whole company that's cool with it. <laughs> Normally, if you don't, if you don't make the bottom line, you're on the street. You know the next the next quarter. Exactly, and I, you know I tell my friends who are in projects that get, eventually get shut down because they didn't work. I say, you know, you always learn more from a success from a failure than from a success. So we should celebrate the failures, and we do. We actually, when a shut up when a an effort gets shut down. There's a big meeting. Everybody applauds. It's like a party because we know that we've learned stuff. We know that we've tried stuff and we know that now we're going to try something new and enough of it works that the whole enterprise, you know, is something that. And how, how do you continues. justify that to, uh, you know, the short sighted um, desires of shareholders? Because. You Honestly, don't. No, 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 here's how you do it. You ask, we ask a different question. So, Matt, what percent of Google's annual revenue gets directed towards X? That is covered by an NDA. That that is covered by an NDA. It is an R. It is an R and D effort that tries to do the crazy things. Um, all the stuff that we're going to talk about about generative AI is based on a technology called transformers that came out of a part of Google called Brain. Brain came out of X. So Waymo came out of X. We've, we've done amazingly impactful things. We have a long time frame. So when we start a project, it's not, you know, it's common for us to say, this is going to take 10 years. We might kill it in two because we can tell that it's not working. Mm -hmm. But if it succeeds, it's going to take 10 years. We're OK with that. So the hard part from from the shareholders is not arguing that we're adding value. I think I think we're clearly adding value. We have to get them to be patient enough to see that value materialize. Right. Okay. And so you're lucky, Matt, and, because there's a cult, there's a culture there. I saw it once or twice when I was playing, where if you did lose, got defeated, beaten heavily, people went away, licked their wounds, but considered where the things went wrong, came back with solutions. If you build that yes. culture you can achieve things by using that way. But the pressure to get results, and as Chuck was so rightly pointing out, it's dollars. I don't have time because I'm committing such a phenomenal amount of money to this. And if we lose too many games, my coach gets fired, all sorts of things. So it's, it's a really, really fascinating place if you can develop a sustained culture like that. We do have the culture. And Alphabet has been fantastic mm. about recognizing that there is room in, a, in, a, in an entity as successful as Alphabet to have a bunch of people, to let them take the long view, to let them try and do incredibly hard things and mm -hmm. see what happens. And obviously, we can't just keep failing. Some stuff eventually has to work, but some stuff does work. Mm -hmm. And the, the people at X who decide, what are we going to work on? When are we going to kill it? When are we going to keep pushing it? They seem to be very good about ensuring that net-net, we're a positive. Mm -hmm. Can you comment, just reflect on a recent uh, AI news story about a John Lennon song where they mm. sampled John Lennon's voice and then had him finish the song because he died before it was recorded. Yeah. Can you just reflect on, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or That's a complicated thing. I think that... Um, we could just say, well, one thing I think instead of more... asking what would Jesus do, we say, what would John Lennon do? <laughs> if, so he, more... if he were here... Would he punch you in the nose? Like, what would he do? More Beatles songs, I think, are an undeniably good thing. I think okay. that, that there, there are two things I think you want to take away from this. Look at what they chose to synthesize. 
they synthesized Lennon's voice. Yep. What made the Beatles so magical is, I think, the words, what they chose to say. That's much harder. Synthesizing a person's voice is relatively speaking easy. So the first thing I think we need to think about is synthesizing a voice and synthesizing the idea, the essence, different thing. And the second thing is the fact that you can synthesize someone's voice is scary because yes. it's going to make deep fakes so, so much more nice of a problem, problem than they currently are. Because now Absolutely. we can make a picture of whoever doing whatever. And we can even attach some voice to it to convince you that it really happened when in fact it didn't really happen. So I think that's a big issue mm -hmm. that huge that will need to be addressed if we're going to keep all of society sort of continue to be grounded in reality as opposed right. to these fabrications. But, but that so has we to need be to think about right that as now, well. Because yes. if, if we don't come up with some way to watermark this technology on a digital level, I mean, what is going to, what is going to stop people from utilizing it in the most heinous ways possible? Nothing, nothing. So that's, you're absolutely right. Um, watermarking is tricky because mm -hmm. You can, I mean, you can pass a law saying all digitally created images must be watermarked. Okay. And then somebody creates an image in a country that doesn't have the law and it's on the internet. And now what do you do? Right. I think the, the way we have to deal with this, um, I think there, there are a couple of things. One is we need to develop the technology. So right now there are, programs that can recognize Bard, which is Google's generative AI that you can talk to. And if you give it a text that was written by Bard, it, they can say, yeah, 95% that was written by Bard, not by a human. We need to use those to okay. understand what was created and what was not. And the same thing can be said of images. There are, there are non-watermark traces that we need to better understand and better make, take advantage of. And the second thing is we need to recognize that there are trusted sources. And we need to pay attention to this came from somewhere that I actually am willing to believe. If they say they took the picture, they took the picture, it actually happened. So a news agency potentially can serve this role in the way that some guy somewhere far away who just creates a picture might not be a trusted source. And we as a society have to be more suspicious, sadly, than we have been, that just because somebody shows me a picture, it doesn't mean it's true. We've discussed some of the positivity and some of the negativity, but if we take the intelligence part of AI, have we actually, since we've been started to play with it, develop it, kind of pointed it in the right direction to do the right things, or have we kind of just wasted our time with it so far? I don't think we've wasted our time. Okay. Okay. First of all, so I think there are um, there are lots of applications of AI that have been phenomenally successful, incredibly important. The car that you just bought was probably manufactured mostly by robots. Hmm. The cars have fewer right. defects coming off the line. Absolutely. They're cheaper. Right. It's a good thing. Are they? Well, there's inflation, <laughs> but I think um, Pathfinder. Right? We want to send a robot to Mars because we can. Hmm. We don't have right. the technology to send people to Mars yet, but we can send our agents there in the form of these automated devices. They have to be pretty independent because round trip message time to Mars is long. You know, the robot has to avoid a rock all by itself because if you don't talk to it, you can't talk or to cliff. it so quickly. Watch out for the cliff. Or a cliff. 20 minutes later, it's too late. Or the yes. Martian. Ex uh, uh, the Martian, clearly, clearly the Martian. Whatever. <laughs> so I think we've done good things. I think that AI is moving very fast at the moment. And when mm. technology moves quickly, it's challenging. It's always been challenging for society to keep up and mm -hmm. for society to say, okay, here's what I have to think about. Here's how the world has actually changed. It's important that society distinguish from the apparent changes, which aren't actually grounded in, in reality, from what actually has happened that matters. So for example, all these generative programs, BARD and others, they're not actually smart. They right. don't actually know what's going on, right. but it's very easy for people to think they're smart. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and to ask them for explanations about which they're completely poorly equipped to respond, as opposed to asking them things that they can respond to. So for example, somebody asked me recently if Bard understood causality. They wanted to understand some causal thing or, or lack of a causal thing. So he said, can Bard understand causality? And I said, okay. And I went to Bard and I said, is there a correlation between the phase of the moon and the amount of chicken eaten in Denmark? <laughs> and it said, absolutely. And it, it quoted a, a paper that had never actually been written and a survey that had never actually been done. It just made all this stuff up. That was, and I told my son about this and he said, dad, why are you asking Bard questions like this? It's not going to answer them. But if I want, I'm a new business and I want to have a website and I can't afford a developer, I can go to Bard and say, make me a website that does this and Bard will do great. So we, all of us need to understand what these entities can do, what they can't do, what they're going to be effective at, what they're going to be ineffective at. And we need to ask them to do what they are good at, which is a lot. It's just not everything. They're mm -hmm. not going to, you know, replace all of us. All of good us. Good news. Being, all yeah. of us all. being the operative. Well, so Chuck, they replaced you apparently <laughs> fine because you're in the closet and you're, this is just the Chuck avatar. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> well, well played, Matt. Yes. <laughs> Matt, if, seeing as though we're talking about robots and Mars, what would you have to build into a program for it to look into deep space and find things that we don't look, don't know to look for just yet? How, how do you go about tweaking AI to be able to achieve that, or is it not quite there yet? I think it's mostly not quite there yet. Right. So the way these things work is, so here's, here's, a, here's how I often think of it. The world breaks down into what I call 5149 problems, mm. where you want to be 51% 50, right is good. So if you're playing the stock market, and you can accurately pick stocks that are going up 51% of the time, you're about to be really rich. Mm. And then you have 100 zero problems where 51% is not good enough, 99% is not good enough. If you're trying to shut down a nuclear reactor in an emergency, you really need the 100% answer. Yep. All of these machine learning systems are incredibly good at the 5149 stuff. Uh. And they're not so good at the 100 zero stuff. So if you want to look in deep, into deep space mm. and you're really interested in something that you thought was probability zero, an alien talking to us or a new kind of supernova or something that we have never seen before, that's sort of a hundred zero problem. Recognizing things whose probability is actually zero and it's a huge surprise. Machine learning systems are not great at that. But no, I, I don't agree. Wait, wait, nerd fight in the progress here. Frame it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Matt, I agree with, I, I in principle agree with you, but there's an important nuance here because I can program the computer to show me something right. that I don't recognize because I have a huge catalog of things I do recognize. No matter what it is. I, so, I, so, so I know it's, what, it's extremely well, broad, but it's something that we haven't, we know we haven't seen it because the computer knows our entire catalog. Correct. The computer right. knows everything that we know, and something shows up that we don't know, and I say, show me everything we don't know. Because that and has that's to be, be anonym anonymous. Because it's going to be an anomalous one in a gazillion thing. Yes, right. or it could just be a glitch in the matrix. Uh, it'll find it, though. And so that's why I, I don't entirely agree it's not good, it, at least astrophysically, in finding the, 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 the lone wolf out there. So the trick is... What you're asking is find the one that doesn't belong, basically. Correct. And mm. these programs will classify everything. You give them eight things and they'll say, oh, oh my this God. belongs in pot seven. Oh my God. And so whether you want it to or not is what you're saying. Whether you, is when, it makes no, the you, decision to do so on its own, even if it creates a category that didn't exist and says, well, now it's in this category. Well, it'll probably put it in an existing category. Okay. Now, no, what, no, you, what I, you can I, no. do, wait, 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 no. hang on, hang on, hang on. What you can <laughs> yeah. do. Don't make me can, come out there. 
<laughs> this, somebody give me some popcorn. This nerd fight's getting good. <laughs> Round what two. you can do is you can say, if the frequency is outside of a frequency I've ever seen, flag mm. it. If the periodicity is shorter than anything I've ever seen, flag it. But what you're doing now is you are actually creating sort of a new category of surprising things that you are defining for the system. Uh -huh. And then saying what belongs in that category. Absolutely, you can do that. But if you see a true surprise, something that you actually had no idea was going to exist. So for example, uh. imagine that you find a pulsar and miraculously, the phase of the pulsar is 100% correlated with the phase of another pulsar two light years away. That's amazing. Something totally bizarre is going on, but the machine won't know right. because it has no idea to look. Because it, it doesn't have, oh, it doesn't have the okay, so it's, it's not a new object, it's a, it's a new phenomenon. Right, It's a sense. new thing. Right, right. A, right. So, the, a brand so these thing. things that are, that are brand new things, brand new it'll thing. just look at that, it'll say, eh, Pulsar, next. Right, yeah, exactly. So, okay, All right, so I'll so give so, you that. Yeah. We're so what you're the, saying is, it doesn't know to look for it because we don't know to look for it. <laughs> Correct. But I, yeah. you know, I, was, and, I was being blunt about it and saying objects and phenomena that are sort of singular that you would just put in a catalog with properties. We use yes neural net searching throughout data to find weird stuff all the time. But you are right. If there are two pulsars that are synchronized, we know what pulsars are. We know what their what their pulses look like, and they're synchronized because aliens are getting ready for the invasion. We would have no idea. No. Nobody would find that. That's correct. Exactly. But but what would happen if this happened? People would say, holy cow, these pulsars are synchronized. And then they would define a new thing, which is a synchronized pulsar pair. And then all of a sudden, that would go into our category. And now mm. we would talk about that pulsar pair as an object. And all of a sudden, the neural net would say, oh, pulsar pair. I've right. seen that before. This is a pulsar pair. But the first time you see one of these fundamentally new phenomena, which is what makes science fun in all honesty, machines don't know. It's too far outside, you know, what they've been trained to do. So we've got to retrain them. Or I, retrain I ourselves. I think. But this I puts a limit so. on AI's think, ability to explore for us. Hmm. So it does. So right now, and I've, I've said this before on the show. What we're good at and what machines are good at are different. Uh -huh. yeah. We are incredibly good at, holy cow, two synchronized pulsars? Who'd have thought it? I got to pay attention to that. We're amazing at that. Machines are. They're mm -hmm. amazing at this thing that you can barely see over here. I looked at it 18 different ways. It's probably a pulsar. They're right. better than we are. But right now, we can do more with machines at our side than either of us can do in isolation. And I think that's great. I'm incredibly optimistic because of that. I, I don't see, and the day is coming somewhere way far away. But right now I don't see that they can get by without us any better than we can get by without them. We're using the better together scenario. Let's flip it into my backyard sports. Could AI become a live in-game play coach, a head coach? Could it so react the answer, in real time? The answer to that and, is yes. And I oh. and I have I have built an NFL play NFL play caller. I have run it in simulation against the choices made by actual play callers. Mm -hmm. And it crushes them. It just annihilates them. What? And it's easily fast enough. I actually I I played with it before joining X. I played with it and I had it and I actually was watching football games with it. And it would put in real time this is what you should do. And I would watch the coach do what he did. And, and then I ran all these simulations. People are, unfortunately, I guess, not terribly good play callers. Play calling is this giant statistics problem. Yes. Machines are going to be great at that. Right. And they're great at it fast. However, so having this does, does your program take into account <clears throat> the adjustments that are made by quarterbacks who recognize coverage in real time? So... The defense plays a call and the offense plays a call. So the answer is call. yes. It does? 
The You're is, kidding yeah. me. No, it's a wrong and question. Me, Wait, Chuck, that's the wrong question. Does your program deflate the ball? <laughs> <laughs> no. That's the right question. <laughs> so the answer to the answer to Chuck's question is that part of my software was who's the quarterback? Okay. Oh. That's enough because the quarterbacks that are effective at adapting to what they see when they come to the line exactly are mm-hmm. going to have slightly different statistics than the quarterbacks yeah. who are not effective. Amazing. So when the program decides, do I want to call a run? Do I want to call a pass? Where do I want to call a pass to? It does know. Damn. Wait, but how, wait, I, 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 I lost, I missed something here. Since you, how do you, what do you mean you do better than the actual call players? Because so you I, don't have an outcome that you can look at. You just say, have shouldn't a, have done that. Should have done what I said. So I, had he done what I, you said, how do you know what the outcome would have been? So there don't there. So there are two ways. First, I, as any, uh, any coach is based on a simulation engine. So I could, I can run that simulation. Now it's sort of a self-licking ice cream cone because yes, it is. Okay. So that's way one. And I think there's still merit there because you can test the accuracy of the simulation. Mm -hmm. The second thing I can do is I can just go back and look at the game and say, okay, the plays where the actual human coach made my play, A, B, C, D, E. The plays where he made a different play, F, G, H, I, J. And then I can look at him and say, oh, A, B, C worked out pretty well. F, G, H, J, they were duds. And it's easy to look after the fact and see whether a play was a success or a failure. Right. But aren't you still just invoking the statistics of past events to predict a invoking, future event? But that's reasonable, right? So there's no, a no, reason. No, no, no. Wait, wait. If that's so the yes. case, isn't that what they're doing every <laughs> single pitch in baseball today? Everything are, is on a – they're overanalyzing it, right, in baseball. Why are they not doing that in football? So Maybe they are. I So that I don't know. I do think that baseball is a little more – Committed to the statistics of the sport than the other nothing else is happening between. between (laughs) I also think that um, the extent to which, so so what you're asking at some level, what you're asking is, how hard is it to build a machine learning or other model that tells you how effective a pitch will be, how effective a football play will be, that is able to predict with reasonable accuracy, whatever. Mm -hmm whatever that is, is able to predict the outcome of a particular sporting choice. The answer is it's, it's not, it's not super hard and it's not super easy. Right. You have to get the data. There's a lot of curation involved. You have Mm -hmm. to use reasonably modern techniques. That's what I did with the NFL thing. And it worked pretty well. I was able to tell what was, what was the actual answer? It was a while ago. I think I was, I was able to, predict run versus pass with very high accuracy. And I was able to predict exactly what play would be called something like 20% of the time. Damn. That's so I, very, I, very high for football. 20%. That's insane. Could you imagine a football team on this being on the sidelines, aside from a Belichick team that's stealing the signals. If you could imagine <laughs> being on the sideline and with high accuracy, knowing at 20%, one out of every five plays, you would know that what they're going to do, you would win. <laughs> you would so win this is part every of, game. This is part of why the software, why the simulations indicated that a machine coach is is really going to do very well against a human coach. That's a, I know, but oh. what if you put what if you put one against another? You know, my AI is better than your AI. Oh, I they love it. Machine they, coach against they, machine did, coach. Oh, yeah. it's the Decepticons versus the Autobots. Do they cancel so, each other out? They they sort of cancel each other out. So, you know, if you... Let's go to chess, which is sort of less mm. controversial. So you can have... Even a, a relatively poor chess program now is way better than the best human. Right. But there are still better programs than worse programs. Right. So the same thing can happen here. Now you have additional facet factors in sports because one of the teams may well be simply more physically talented than another team. True. And then the question becomes, can a difference in the quality of the coaches, whether they're ARs or not, 
overcome the difference in the physical qualities of the team? And do you want to allow that? I don't know. But right. there will be better AIs and worse AIs. Yeah. How big those differences are, I don't know, because right now there are no AIs. But that's going to be another facet of what makes a team good. Is how what good likelihood, is Matt, is there that sports organizations, be whichever sport, are already using AI technology for in-game situations? I think it's pretty small. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I joined X, I was I was trying to talk to the NFL about using the software developed for play calling, mm. and it was it seemed pretty clear to me that they weren't doing anything like that yet. Yeah. Now I've been in X yet. for a couple of years, so we're looking back two years. Yeah, I think that eventually this is going to happen, but of course, not yet. But it's moving towards that because right now you're using next gen and next gen stats, and what mm. they're using, what they're looking at is uh, percentage, uh, like likelihood, um, and probabilities for certain plays at certain times. You've never seen more two point conversions in the NFL than you have right now. That is a direct result of uh, st statistically, you should do it. You've never seen more teams going for fourth and whatever uh, because statistically, you should do it. So we're moving towards that direction. So about that specifically, about, I was probably eight years ago now, I did some statistical work for the Oregon Ducks. And I told the coach at the time, I gave him these huge printouts with what you should do in every situation on fourth down. And I said, just stop punting between the 35 yard lines. That's really what it all says. And he stopped. And that was the year that the Oregon Ducks were the best they were. And the other college teams noticed and they stopped punting between the 35 yard lines. And you're absolutely right. What has happened at the NFL level is people have noticed. So when I see someone not punting between the 30, not going for it on fourth down, I smile because it's basically my work that the statistical work I did a while ago to get the Oregon Ducks to stop doing it. And then wow. it propagated out. So well, just so I understand on fourth down, rather than punt to release the, to, to um, return the ball to the opposing team, you, they would go for first down. And in some percent of the cases they don't, but if I'm on my own 35 yard line, I'm handing you the ball at the 35 yard line. Right. And you're saying that risk is not as great as just handing over the ball because yeah. I might have gotten a first down and kept you're, going. You're only starting 10, 10 yards further than uh, than you would if I had if you had made a fair catch. Yeah. So it, just, you're only conceding 10 yards. You're conceding 10 yards by going for it. I mean, by not going for it. That's all you're really giving up. You know, unless there's a really good return. Now, does it take that into account? Because that's fascinating. Yeah, it takes it took everything into account. Okay, so yeah, um, if you got a great return and, guy, you know, hmm. that's that's yeah. also it's danger. also a function of how late in the game is it and how much right. are you ahead or behind by. The actual rules, it turns out, if we're doing sports, is don't punt between the 35 yard lines and always go for it on fourth and one, even from your own 10. Whoa! And I told that to the Oregon Ducks coach, and he said, I can't do that, I'll lose my job. I'll lose my job. Yeah. <laughs> but can't be placed from by a straight AI. Yes. From a straight per statistical perspective, the, and the bottom line is, if you punt from your own 10, you're still screwed. They're still going to have unbelievably good field position. Yes, you're right. And if you go for it on your own 10, fourth and one, you have a reasonably good chance of getting it, and now all of a sudden, you're back in it. Wow. But he just said he couldn't do that. He looked. He just looked me in the eye and said, I can't do that. I'll lose my job. Damn. So, um, wow. Did he, did he lose his job anyway? <laughs> uh, he went to the NFL. He had a great year for the Oregon Ducks. He went to the NFL. Well, there Good you go. Him. He lost his job upwards. That's fantastic. You said earlier on, Matt, about how machine learning programs are getting quicker. Are we going to get to the point where we can really start to predict some of the big natural disasters, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, or, you know, it, or is it as good as it gets right now? I think well, that, let, me, let me be more uh, precise there. There's certain, uh, I don't know if earthquakes wouldn't be the best example here, but certainly storms mm. where we have limits to how many days in advance you can predict the weather because there's some, you know, chaos takes over. Yeah. 
what how does ai handle chaos any better than we've ever handled it before so those are sort of the same question and i think that actually comes back to this 5149 versus 100 zero thing hmm. so predicting an earthquake that's a 100 zero thing how many hurricanes are there going to be this season that's more like a 5149 thing dealing with chaos very much a 5149 thing the stock market is sort of chaotic but i'm want to i want to I don't have to get it right all the time. I just want to get it right most of the time. But I should chaos, I just be can... clear that my our audience knows more precisely what we mean by chaos. So what we learned back, I guess, in the 70s and 80s, that you can start a system out with certain variables having certain values, and then you could run a system, and not all systems would behave this way, but some systems, you get a result, okay? And then you can make a tiniest adjustment in your initial parameters and then set it go, let it go forward and you get a completely different result. So that small changes in your initial conditions would not lead to small out changes in your outcomes. It led to huge changes in your outcomes, which meant that your ability to predict far into the future for some systems was essentially mathematically impossible. So just so this that's is, what I meant by chaos you know, here. A butterfly flaps its wings in East Africa and there's a hurricane six weeks later in the Bahamas. And my, my answer is, you. it's again, it's the 100 zero versus 5149. I cannot tell you there will be a hurricane in the Bahamas on October 27th. But I can tell you there are going to be more hurricanes this year than average. In general, more hurricanes. 5149. This specific hurricane that depends on that specific butterfly, I don't know any better than I used to. How about quantum computing when you add that into the effect? Because now you're looking at billions and billions of data points that are being fed to the AI. So quantum computing is good. I know less about it than I want to and that I wish because I certainly have the background. Um, right now, Conventional machines appear to be able to process the data we need them to process. And quantum computing, I think, will be helpful in other ways. Okay. So the quantum stuff appears to be best at sort of doing an almost uncountable number of things in parallel. So I want to find an integer that has certain properties. And I can sort of look at hundreds of billions of integers simultaneously using the quantum stuff. That's cool. But the machine learning stuff, I'm just trying to look for properties in enormous data sets that involve sort of looking at all the data and seeing how it interacts with each other. And that we seem at least so far to be able to do with, it takes a lot of computing, a ton of computing, but we seem to be able to currently work. There might be a way to query that same set of data with the higher performance quantum computing in ways we had not thought to even ask maybe the data. maybe hmm. interesting uh, by the way about that butterfly do you remember that article in the journal of irreproducible results uh where <laughs> <laughs> i think i said this on another episode uh this is a journal where it's it's for idle scientists who have some crazy thought that is completely stupid but they want to publish it anyway and so it goes into the journal of irreproducible results so uh, one of them was the calculation that heaven is hotter than hell. And it looked at the thermodynamics of souls and how many people are heaven worthy versus hell worthy. And right. It added up all the energy of the souls going into heaven and it made heaven much hotter. So stupid yeah. calculations like the that. Problem so one of them is, was. Okay. I was just going to say the problem is that hell does not have air conditioning. No, and that's. He and heaven does. <laughs> so this paper has this photo of a butterfly and it said, it captured the butterfly that caused Hurricane Andrew. In gotcha. <laughs> it's an, the, 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 one one bu the, the one butterfly that went to hell. <laughs> so I did not read that paper. Yeah, you missed that. That was no. a good one. Yeah. Um, so Matt, uh, what I think is most fearful for people is when AI does not just the tasks we give it better than we've ever done it, but when it self-learns and 
achieves what some mild version of what we might call consciousness. And this sort of artificial general intelligence, I think is the scariest part of AI that that gets that's been discussed in recent months. Could you just comment on where that is today? It is scary. Um, I think that what we need to understand is what this technology is actually doing. These things that we're dealing with, these generative AI programs, they have no notion of truth. They have no notion of reality. They have no notion of fact. Or All they're doing, even. or morality, probably. or anything, yeah. right? All they're doing is trying to predict what an expert would say, just what words would come out of his mouth. And as a result, they sort of don't know what they're doing. They just know what someone might say. I don't think we're anywhere near a point where these things exhibit true general intelligence. We need to understand when we're at, when we're interacting with them. These things don't understand that there are, they don't understand there are facts. Not right. that they don't understand the facts. They don't understand. No, they don't even facts. know what so, it, right. Yeah. So hmm. when I asked about the phase of the moon and chicken in Denmark, and I got back this long study that didn't even exist, it had no idea. And I actually asked it. I said, are you sure? And it responded, it said, well, I'm not really that sure because this was the only study I could find. It's just standing by its non-facts. And it has no idea that this is not how you look at the world. So is that said, what, well, what they call a mirage when it comes back to something? It's a hallucination. A hallucination. It's hallucination. And it doesn't realize, it's, it doesn't know it's made something up. Right? right? When we talk about making something up, right. just the phrase is identifying a distinction between actual reality and whatever you're saying. These things don't know there is an actual reality. Okay, so, so is that a necessary yeah. guardrail? Is, 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 a, is a necessary guardrail to imbue the digital intelligence with the concept of these things that it will do, uh, you know, like what reality is, what a fact is, what truth is. I mean, is it necessary? I don't. It would be good, but I don't know how you do it. These things are so divorced from the notion of a reality. You can't just say, hey, there are facts. Remember that. It's just not how they work. It's not wait, how wait, they're wait, architected. Matt, could, the problem, could the problem be that these language model AI uh, machines are coming of age at a time where the internet is filled with non-facts? So it's not uh, its think... fault we fed it junk food. Mm. Had it come around right at the beginning of the internet mm. where you didn't have QAnon and all the rest of this, could might it have performed a little better? The fact, the, the fact, and it is a fact, that these things have no notion of truth would still be true. People have tried to curate the information on which they are trained so they're not trained on nonsense. And they still have this problem with hallucinating the fact the problem is they don't understand that there is an abstract, an abject reality in which the, of which they are a part. And I think you're right. The problem is not the programs. The problem is us. We need to recognize that these things are divorced from reality. We need to remember, if I want a website created, it's going to do well. If I want to ask it, is there a correlation between these two crazy things that I pulled out of the air, it's going to do badly. And we shouldn't pay attention. So if somebody, when I told my son, I asked Bard, is there a correlation between the phase of the moon and the amount of chicken eaten in Denmark? His immediate response was, don't ask Bard that, that's stupid. I do think there's going to be a job here and it's going to be an important job, which is how do I take what I want to know? And it's like prompt programming. What prompt do I give Bard to get back the most useful answer I can and to avoid all the junk? That's going to be a thing. There are going to be people who are good at it. There are going to be classes that teach you how to do it. It's going to be a real skill that we are going to need. Okay, so now let's make that a given. What do you do? And this may be more philosophical than you know than than you're uh, you know qualified to answer. I'm certainly not. What do you do with the people who purposefully use the technology for the end of misinformation, confusion, and chaos. 
Because even if you do everything that you just said, those agents can still utilize the technology to do some serious harm to society. Correct. And I think they will. And I think this gets back to what we were talking about before. I think you need to have trusted sources. Trust is going to become much more valuable because lack of trust is going to be such, so much more dangerous. So you need to have trusted sources. You need to the extent you can to have technology that can help identify generated images as opposed to real images. So there's, there is both a technical problem there. Can I produce software that tells me this is fake, this is real? Technical problem. And there's a social problem. How do I get people to care that they're looking at real information as opposed to, to sort of garbage? That's half my life. And That's half my life as an educator. I right? believe you. It's a, and right. it's, I think it's, it is a huge part of what scientists need to do. And our responsibility to do it is even greater now than it's ever been. Because but this is this need... is more than one facet. This is more than one facet, I'm guessing now, because yes, scientists and programmers have a responsibility, but the legislation, and I mean, you can't make it governmental because if I go do something in another country, that government's got no power. So who are you going to get? Space Force to oversee it? No, that won't happen. So who who will bring to bear legislation and these bad actors keep them in their place? This is going to be a part. Well, that that'll have to be part of what uh, Matt was talking about in the yeah. recognition portion. You mm -hmm. would have to be able to recognize where these bad actors are. Like most of the dark web, you know where the people are located. You you actually know where they are. You know, it's just that mm. they are in a country that's not going to do anything to them. So yeah, I you just know, wonder if if bad actors here put civilization at risk that calls for some kind of uh international yes oversight effort. totally i think i think that the so first of all the technical problems here are are hard and they're challenging and they're important identifying generated text versus non-generated text and i am i am thrilled because i'm a technologist and i get to spend my productive time working on technical problems, and I don't have to solve the social problems. That's that's apparently Neil's job. <laughs> well, I'm and, so glad this all works out for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. You don't I have do, to worry about it. <laughs> I do care about the need to inform people about what the technology can do. Okay. I do think that this particular technology is going to take this problem that you mentioned that we have, right? Truth has become more elusive. And I think that this technology potentially can make it more elusive still. But it is still up to us, and I think it's still possible for us, to say no, enough. We are going to be committed to actually knowing whether the sky is blue before we start going tell, telling all of our friends and neighbors what color the sky is, we should check. The sky really is blue. Here's why I'm convinced. Here's my source. Yes, it's trusted. So that's why I'm willing to talk to you about it. Well, part of me thinks that if AI has these hallucinations and it doesn't really know what truth is, there's nothing intelligent about it at all. So it's been misnamed. It's it's a disruptive force in our culture and in our society. And maybe we should rebrand it as artificial idiocy. Um, and it's not going to like that, Neil. <laughs> I better watch that. Neil, you were trying to get me killed in this closet. Well, <laughs> in the back of the closet. I, let, me, let me just bring some summative remarks here and, and get your final reaction, Matt. It seems to me if deep fakes become so good that no one can trust them, then that's basically the end of the internet as any source of information. And that has a positive side to it. Because it means, for example, let's look at QAnon. It means QAnon won't even believe the stuff that's wrong that it thought was true because it doesn't trust it. Be because the, the, the level of misinformation would be so total that people who were previously misinformed will be worried that they'd be misinformed. I think that the amount of misinformation can go up. I think there will always, there. I think there's likely to always be an internet. I think that it's likely to always have 
valuable, factual, accurate not if you don't know which is which information. Mm-hmm. And the trick yeah. is going to be to find it. Mm-hmm. And if you think about the stuff that I talked about. On the technical side, we need the ability to find it. And on the social side, we need to have the desire. Desire to find it. desire. And so I think we, both of those things. Isn't it a positive outcome happen. if QAnon can't even believe this the, the stuff that's not true? Isn't that a positive that outcome? That might be that might be a positive outcome in isolation. But if QAnon has that problem, then so do all so the people have, who are trying to affect positive yeah. change. Well, then that that, that brings us to something that we haven't touched upon, and that is our ability as a as a society where the majority of people are scientifically literate and trained as critical thinkers so Mm -hmm. that they know exactly where to place their trust yeah that that is really where the problem is okay now you put it back on me that i got to train everybody to think this way okay come on now you that you know that that that's your job I wanted to leave the blame on Matt at the end of the show. Now you <laughs> no, put the blame we, on me. Before we, before we leave the show, Neil, Matt, you're saying how AI is learning at quicker speeds and is going to get there sooner, et cetera, et cetera. Will it not then solve its own, solve this problem for us, therefore Thank itself? You. Thank you. I don't, I don't see a reason for, to expect that it will, it will figure this problem out. I, Chuck, I do agree with you. I think that People don't have to be trained as scientists, but I think they need to be trained as thinkers. They need to be able to understand the information with which they're presented and evaluate it relatively dispassionately. And I think that education, broadly, education is going to become much more important as we need it more. It's also the case that as machines start doing the drudgery, Education becomes more important because we've been freed from the Dutch drudgery. We get to do the fun, hard stuff. People need to understand what that is, how they can contribute, and all that. And all that. And I think that's going to happen. I. But you, I, you mentioned education there, man. Sorry to cut across you, but people are handing in their homework or their assignments created by AI. Are we not? I think that we, is. Are we not heading down a? A, a path where generations in the future will not have any desire to self-educate. I think that I think the answer to that is no. I think this thing where kids are handing in homework written by by Bard or what have you. I think this is a relatively. I hope this is a relatively temporary. Yeah, I anomaly. agree. I agree too. And yeah. we'll we'll sort that out. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, honestly, it's sort out of bull. It just means that the school system values your grades more than you value learning, yeah, there and you so go. you give them grades. Right. And so that that that'll shift in a good way how the school systems uh, place their value on what it is to teach you something. And it yes, may awaken in right. students. It may awaken in students a reckoning or a recognizing of that value themselves. Yeah, mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know. Exactly. Yes. Uh, yeah. Exactly. A, well, we can. So, think, so before I mean, AI takes us over and and exterminates us, there are these good sides of what. <laughs> I think there are some there are some short term. There's some short-term bumps. I mean, the fact that there are going to be so many deep fakes is going to be a short-term bump. But, yeah, okay. you know, problems are always opportunities in disguise. So the commitment to being able to recognize what's true and what isn't, the realization that there are facts, that's something that I can see society embracing more than it has because it has to. Because it has because to. Because if you there, don't believe there, yeah. in reality, you get overrun. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So... Maybe. All right, that's At a good this, put them, to better. end this on. That, thank you for finally bringing this around. S- someplace possible. Some hope. Plus, that we got to get Chuck and Gary out of the closet. Yes, we please. Do. <laughs> it's been great to talk to you, Matt. Always good to have you on the show. Thanks for coming coming around again. And this will not be the last time we reach out to you. Mm-hmm. So yeah, cool. Always making fun. sure making sure. Always good to have you, Chuck, Gary. This has been Star Talk Special Edition. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. Keep looking up. <laughs> <laughs>